Thank you. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm Nella, and I play on the computer for a living. So I'm a designer, but that's how a lot of people outside of our field of work uh, look at what we do. So they just see our, us you know, doing something on a computer all day, and uh, they don't have the slightest idea what actually being a designer is like and what it means. So that's a source of some issues with clients. So what I'm going to talk about today is pretty relevant for other industries as well. Uh, but designers especially, you know, my heart goes out to my colleagues because uh, we have the special privilege that anyone, so anyone who has eyes and a finger to point with can tear our work apart. Yeah, uh, so, you know, when people ask me what I do and I tell I'm a designer, and they say, wow, that's cool, that sounds very creative. And I say, yeah, it is, I love it. But there are some parts of this job that are less fun than others. Let's just put it that way. And one of them is dealing with clients who butcher our work. So I'm sure you all had that happen more often than you like to admit. So developers, you know, have it easy. Nobody wants to read your code, not even other developers. And designers have to fight for their ideas all the time. And it can get very draining, and it can make us lose passion for our work. So what clients often don't understand is that the work that we do is not intended for them. It's intended for the users of their product. But usually designers get you know, swept away with the client's sense of self-importance that they lose a track of that. So what we do is actually uh, our job is to figure out the needs of the users, how they think, how they behave, and create a solution for them while also making the client money. So it's a win-win situation. But if we don't explain that to the client, then usually our discussion is brought back to personal preferences, and it's a lot of back and forth, it can get very emotional, and it can end with crying into a glass of rakia, asking ourselves, where did it go wrong? And it went wrong from the very beginning. And whose fault is that? Well, it's our own fault, of course. And that's good, because it means that it's something we can change. So, one symptom of this problem is offering multiple, ver multiple variations of a design concept. And it's taken for granted in design. It's even taught in design schools and uh, courses. So the reason we do this, so we can just, you know, we'll make several varia variations, offer them to the client and say, OK, uh, hope they'll pick one of them, and we'll be done with it. But it's not how it works, does it? Now, the client will say, yeah, I like the colors in the first one, uh, but I like the photo in the second one, and the footer in the third one. Can you, can you just you know, mix that all together? And so it brings more and more revisions. Uh, so basically, we're not doing ourselves or our client a favor when we offer multiple concepts. What we're doing, actually, is we're forcing them to make a decision about something that they don't know about, enough about. So they're paying us, you, because we're the experts. They're not the experts. They want us to deliver them a solution, not a buffet of half-baked ideas. So asking what do you like is the wrong question, because we're not selling t-shirts here. That's not how we work. Now, there are several mistakes that we make, and I identified the two that I think are the most important ones. And the first one is that we rely on hope a lot. So we hope that the perfect, agreeable, reasonable client will just fall into our lap and will ride off into the sunset on a unicorn together and make beautiful design babies. So, uh, but that doesn't happen. You know, we want the client to be on board with our process without us having to do the hard job of educating them. But clients who will accept every proposal you make for them and be happy with everything you do are rare, almost as rare as actual unicorns. So 
That's not how this works. You can't base your business on hope alone. Uh, of course, there are things you can do to change the client, change your relationship with the client, and I'll tell you a bit about that. So you have to explain how your process works and how the client can provide feedback from the very beginning of your relationship. So not in the middle of the project when things have already gone to hell. Not in the beginning of the second project or in the third project, no. Right from the first interaction with the client, you need to be setting the stage for what's coming. So here are some ways you can do that. I recommend combining all of them, uh, but it's maybe it's too overwhelming, so you can start implementing one by one. So the first one is uh, in the kickoff meeting, it can be in person or a video call. You ask the client about their business and the problem they want to solve. You, you're quiet, you're listening, and you're asking questions, and you let them describe the problem in their own words. And then you can determine whether you can help them or not, because sometimes you can't help a client. And if you can, then you explain to them how you're going to do it. So you need to explain how your process works and help them imagine what it's like to be working with you. So take them through all the steps, all the phases of your process. And that's also a great bonus sales tip. So when you can get people to imagine, to visualize uh, the process, they are more likely to get on board to actually buy your service. So another way is you can create a welcome guide. It's like a PDF document where you outline your process and your policies. So you don't have to repeat yourself. You can just attach it and send to your potential client. In your proposals, don't just tell them it costs that much money. No. Uh, write out your process in detail and determine how many revisions they get for the price that they're paying and which types of revisions are allowed when, so in which phase of the project. Also put it in your contract. So you have to have a contract. And of course, now you did all this hard work of writing things down, you can reuse it for content marketing. So create blog posts where you explain how your process works. Uh, and when someone reads that post and then decides to hire you, that's a great sign that they're ready because they already know what it's like to be working with you. So <clears throat> you, we talked about hope, and it manifested in other ways as well. So we hope that the client will give us all the relevant information that we need on their own. But they won't because they don't know what's relevant. They don't know what we need. So, we need to extract all the data we can from them in the very beginning of the project. Because feedback is only useful if it provides new information, something we didn't know before. When you collect information in the beginning, you reduce the need for feedback later. So the second mistake that we do is that we take our experience for granted. And so it looks like this. You're very experienced. You've been doing this for a while so you know what you're doing. Uh, and there are parts of your process that you don't even think consciously about. You just do it because of all this integrated experience that you have. And that's great. But the problem is when you don't think about what you do, then uh, you have a hard time explaining that to other people, and your clients especially. And you don't want to be in that position. So you have to be able to explain what you did. You know, not just, oh, a lightning flash in my brain and, wow, here's the finished solution. We know that creative process is messier than that. So you need to be able to talk about your process. So you need to be able to give your clients solid arguments for every decision that you made, something they will understand. Your clients will usually be some business owners, right? They understand business, they understand numbers, stats, things like that. So use that to back up your decisions, and they will be more likely to trust you. So of, of, uh, also, you can show them how your process evolved, through it, how your design evolved through iteration. So give them a behind-the-scenes look, and you will earn their trust. 
Now, you know, you know what you're doing, you know you're a professional, but your client will have moments of doubt. So you need to calm them down a bit and make them less anxious. You need to prove to them that you're a professional. So what a lot of designers do, they just uh, attach a screenshot. I used to do that too, so no judgment. Attach a screenshot and they write, OK, here's my proposal. What do you think? And this just invites problems. So you need to put your work presented in context so the client understands what they're looking at. Uh, not just show them a visual and let them wonder uh, and try to guess what, they, what you need from them. So you need to prove you're a professional every step of the way. And it's easier than you think. You would be surprised because the majority of your colleagues are not doing this. So if this is something you do, you're already like rising toward the top. So here are some ways you can do that. Uh, when you're presenting your design, uh, either do an in-person meeting or do like a Skype call and share your screen with the client. And as they're looking at the design, point to certain parts and explain why you made certain design decisions and what's the benefit for the user and for the business. If you can't do that, if the client is like in a different time zone or you're presenting a minor revision, you can also do this in a form of the presentation or a web page. So you put up uh, your visuals and then write through descriptions of what's going on. So they're not just looking at the visuals, they understand, they get a little behind the scenes of what happened. You can also put your progress uh, screenshots as well if you want. So while we're at doing things in writing, when a client accepts your proposal, make sure they confirm via email because you need written proof. So people may not mean any harm, but they sometimes just forget what they told you. And it's extremely frustrating when you can't prove it. And this happened to me, so let it not happen to you. What happened with the projecting screen? OK. Yeah. So you're probably wondering, you know, OK, so now I need to invest all this time in the design. And then on top of that, I need to invest more time in the presentation. That's insane. Well, that's the general idea. Yeah. Uh, the presentation will actually help you to sell your solution to the client. You will get client buy-in easier. And that's also a great test of your design solution. If you can't tell a compelling story about it, then maybe it's just not that good. Besides, the time investment that you put into this presentation, it will be saved many times over in revisions. So you, there are some situations where this is going to be difficult. Uh, that's why a lot of people are not doing it. It's not, it's not very easy. Uh, there will be clients that will not be on board with your process. And so you need to be clear from the very beginning about how you work. Because this way, you're going to push away the clients from hell that you don't want to work with and attract the clients that are better quality. And of course, if you start working with someone who's used to working with designers, like a they expect a dozen revisions and three variations on in each version. It's going to be very, very difficult to change them because they already have expectations of what working with designers are like. But when you're working with someone new who hasn't been working with a designer before, then you are the benchmark for the entire design industry for them. So be a great benchmark. So, I know that a lot of you will not implement this when you get home, and that's OK. And if you have a better way, I'd actually love to hear about it. So yesterday, we heard a lecture by Ma Marco Dugonic, the client experience design, which has a little, maybe, a different angle on this. And I'm, it was a great uh, talk. I enjoyed it, and it gave me a lot to think about. So you know, it's good to hear different opinions. But if you want to remember something that will be useful to you in the future, just because something is a standard practice in design, in development, in marketing, wherever, it doesn't mean it's good for you. So I suggest that you 
take the same approach that you use in your creative work and bring it to your client process. And then test, iterate, and improve your process the same way you treat your designs. So if you're 100% happy with your process, your clients, your money, uh, your experience that you have, the relationships you're still making with your clients, then great. That means you're doing it right. But if you're not 100% happy, then this means there is some room for improvement. And I suggest that you start here. So thank you.